Welcome um, on behalf of um, Virginia Humanities, the, who produces this wonderful festival, the Virginia Festival of the Book. Please silence your cell phones. And then they tell you to tweet about the event. I always think that's a funny thing to follow up on. Um, but yes, if you're going to tweet, use the hashtag VA Book Fest or VA Book 2022. Um, and remember, this festival is free of charge, but not free of cost. So please support um, the festival with a donation so we can continue to bring wonderful authors here every year. Um, and they, they mentioned a program evaluation. They're not doing the paper anymore, but you can do it online at vabook.org slash feedback. And I know they really do read those. Um, and you can also use a QR code, I think, on the back of your program if you're into that. Um, so in order to keep our community as safe as possible, we just ask you to keep your masks on for the event. And we all had negative COVID tests and vaccines and all sorts of things. And that's why they're letting us um, talk without a mask, which I'm sure you're grateful for so that you can actually understand what we're saying. Um, there's book sales afterwards. Um, please support our local booksellers and these authors. Um, it's going to be out in the the hall there. Um, yes, so this uh, panel is called Accidental Detectives You Don't Want Coming After You. Um, my name is Meredith Cole. I'm from, if I don't know you, I'm from Charlottesville, so I may have run into you at Wegmans, I don't know, but you've had a mask <laughs> on and so did I. Um, I'm a former screenwriter and filmmaker. I grew up in Scottsville. I moved away for a number of years and then the hook, I moved back to raise my son here. Um, I am a mystery writer. Two books, Posed for Murder and Dead in the Water, were published with St. Martin's Minotaur. Um, I teach writing occasionally at Writer House. And I'm really excited because um, it's always fun to introduce authors, new authors or new to you authors or authors that came out during the pandemic and you somehow missed <laughs> their debut. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna introduce the panelists. Next to me is Elle Casamano. And where do I have her bio? She is a USA Today best-selling author, an international thriller award winner, an Edgar Award nominee, and her acclaimed young adult novels include Nearly Gone, Holding Smoke, The Suffering Tree, and Seasons of the Storm. Her debut novel for adults, Finley Donovan is Killing It, was a People magazine pick, one of New York Public Library's best books of 2021, and has been optioned for a TV series. In addition to writing novels for teens and adults, Elle's essays have appeared in the Huffington Post and Time, and she lives with her husband and two sons in Virginia, and I questioned her earlier. It's Williamsburg, Virginia, right now. Next to her is Naomi Hirahara. She is the author of Clark and Division in the Eternal Lay, and she's an Edgar Award-winning author of the Mass Array Mystery Series, including Summer of the Big, is it Bot? Bachi? Bachi. Bachi. Okay. Bachi. Bachi. Thank you. I what was right. Around, and then I doubted myself. <laughs> <laughs> it was a Publishers Weekly Best Book of the Year and one of Chicago Tribune's 10 Best Mysteries and Thrillers. And I met Naomi years ago and we tried to figure out how. And I think it was when you won the Edgar Award. So you probably had several glasses of wine, but I remembered you. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was the one where my mother was still in the hotel room. She didn't come to the banquet. <laughs> See, I didn't remember your mother, and now I know why. Yeah. <laughs> okay, next to Naomi is Catherine Shellman, a former actor, one-time political consultant, and current writer. Her debut novel, The Body in the Garden, was a suspense magazine best book of 2020 and led to her being named one of book pages 16 women to watch. Her upcoming novel, Last Call at the Nightingale, is on multiple most anticipated mystery lists for 2022. She's a graduate of William and Mary, and she lives and writes in the mountains of Virginia in the company of her husband, children, and the many houseplants she keeps accidentally murdering. Mountains of Virginia means Charlottesville. Like, it just doesn't mean a whole lot to people outside of the state. We understand the coded language. As opposed to Williamsburg, which has no mountains, which we've already discussed. But it does have William and Mary. <laughs> but it does have William and Mary, exactly. Which my husband went to as well. So, 
I just would like you each to talk about the latest book that is here that you brought that you're all talking about. Um, so tell me about Finley Donovan. Yes. Finley Donovan is my, um, is my debut series for adults. It's a mystery series, but it's a genre, what we call a genre bender. So we would also consider it dark comedy. There's a, a, a little bit of thriller in there, a, a dash of romance, um, a little bit of women's fic. And so it sort of straddles a whole lot of lines. Um, it's a rompy, dark mystery. Um, I wouldn't categorize it as cozy. It runs a little bit edgier than, than your standard cozy might. Um, so it's a little bit different, and it's been super fun to write. It's the story of Finley Donovan, who is um, a struggling romantic suspense novelist who is mistaken for a contract killer. <laughs> and no authors were... Were harmed. Were harmed in the making of the books. Um, and totally fiction. <laughs> Naomi. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me here in um, Charlottesville. I did 22 steps yesterday, so I... 22,000. Uh, 22,000, oh yeah. <laughs> 22,000 steps, and so I got I would, be, I would ask if you were sick if you only did 20. Yeah, <laughs> I was going, where's my response for doing that? Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so I, I, I got to see this area, and it's been really wonderful. Um, okay, so for this panel, I'm talking about my Leilani Santiago Hawaii series, and basically it's... Um, Little women in Hawaii with a dead body. That's nice. basically the premise. <laughs> and the second one, an internal lay, um, is actually you're getting an early peak because the official launch is on the 22nd. And um, the reason it, it's set on the island of Kauai. Has anyone been to Kauai? Yeah, the Green Garden. Don't you want to go to Hawaii, Kauai right this moment? <laughs> so it was really wonderful to um, actually escape to Kauai. I could not go to Kauai to do research during the pandemic, but thank goodness for the mayor who was doing TikToks. Um, actually, this book is set during the pandemic, and I know you're cringing, oh no, but when I was talking to my editor, she goes, Naomi, you have to you know, incorporate that because it really affected tourism. The good thing was that no one, you know, it's set in October 2020, so no one, no one was really, there, there wasn't, um, a big problem of people having COVID or even dying of COVID. It was just that there were no tourists. And it was it's almost like a locked room mystery. So there's a body of a stranger that is washed up. She's still living. And Leilani and her sisters um, save her. And who is this woman? You know, where did she come from? So that that starts the mystery. All right. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, and I'm so glad to be up here with such talented writers today. Um, I am the author of the Lily Adler Mysteries. So the one I'm talking about today is the second one, Silence in the Library. Um, and these are sort of traditional whodunit historical mysteries. They're set in Regency London, so 1815. So it's the vibe is kind of if you take your favorite like BBC period piece, but you, instead of everyone being worried about marriage, they're really worried about murder. Um, and so it's got kind of cozy vibes, a lot of historical elements, um, but it's not a strict cozy. So the main character is Lily Adler. She's a young widow who, uh, in trying to restart her life and figure out what she's going to do after the death of her husband at an unexpectedly young age, um, she ends up almost literally stumbling over a dead body and uh, getting swept up in an accidental murder investigation, so very appropriate for the title of this panel. Um, and in the second book, Silence in the Library, uh, she encounters yet another dead body. This one is the uh, a close friend of her father with whom, she ha with whom she has a very rocky relationship, so there's uh, family drama, there's a murder mystery, there's, you know, people keeping secrets that have been kept for years about who's in their family and who they're not talking about. And then, then underneath all that, um, just Lily trying to still find her feet in her, her new life um, as a woman alone in a society where that's kind of a little bit frowned on. So um, I had sort of a general question to start us off. Um, and, and, and then I think, you know, I, I always am curious if people start with a plot 
with the characters or with a setting when they start their book. Now, I know you two are talking about the second book in the series, so that's a little bit different. But Catherine, do you want to start us off? Did you start with the plot on this one? or? Um. For this one, I almost always start with with characters. Uh, doing the second book in the series is a little bit is a little bit different. It's a little more character mixed with plot. Um, but for I think in a lot of ways they all kind of go together because especially when you're writing historical, who the characters are is so informed by the setting in which they live and the time period that they're in. Um, and then, you know, if you're writing a murder mystery, as I'm sure all of you have experienced, you have to really know what your plot is before you know how your characters get from point A to point B, um, even though they can still surprise you along the way. But I think for this series, it's, it's a pretty character-driven series. So those are, that's who I end up starting with. Um, the three main characters, sort of my trio of sleuths, uh, are Lily and then her friends Jack and Ophelia. And they... Basically, from the moment I started writing, they were very clearly defined characters. I knew exactly who they were and where they were headed personally. Um, and then I just had to figure out how that interacted with all the dead bodies they were going to find. <laughs> <laughs> um, this series is... Um, actually, it had to be setting for this uh, particular um, series of books. And in Kauai, they have Wamea Canyon, which is their little Grand Canyon, which is amazing in Hawaii. They have a Grand Canyon. And it's a, a type of place when you walk around, you get like red dust, like all over your shoes, you know, by walking around. And that's where I have um, the Santiago family. And um, because I'm writing about a certain place and they, you know, work in the tourism industry, um, of course, they run a shave ice stand. So the occupation was really crucial. And just like Elle, I don't think mine are straight cozy. They're probably a little bit cozier than yours. But I think we're trying to create kind of like a new subject, maybe a contemporary yeah. mystery. That's, That's what I would say. Yeah. yeah. So um, and for some reason, with Clark and Division, my historical and this one, I'm writing a lot about sisters. And um, which is odd because I have no sisters. <laughs> but family is super important to me. Um, we don't actually, my mother's from Japan, we don't have a whole lot of extended family in America. So as a result, like family is even more important to us. So when I was um, starting out as a writer, um, when I was in elementary school, I just love like Southern stories. I love like Ma and Pa, you know. <laughs> Remember that old series, Ma and Pa Kettle and all these kids? And I, I would write little books, you know, on each sibling. And I would do it in my um, impression of Southern dialect, which was really <laughs> terrible. But um, because I was raised in a um, bilingual household, I'm used to code switching and hearing a mixture of languages. And that's why Pigeon. I have to warn you, in the Santiago series, there's a lot of pigeon in there, and because that's what I love to do, uh, play around with dialect. Finley Donovan was born on February 1st, 2018, <laughs> in a crowded Panera restaurant um, over lunch while I was in retreat with my two beloved critique partners, Megan Miranda and Ashley Elston. Um, we have been writing side by side uh, since 2011. Um, we've more or less, even though we live apart, um, we make it a point to get together at least once a year to retreat. Um, and during our retreats, we catch up on life. We talk about our careers. We talk about our kids. Um, we've mothered side by side all these years as well. Um, and it was at this particular lunch in this crowded Panera when it was my turn to troubleshoot through a particularly troublesome plot point in a murdery scene of a book that was taking place in a magical world. And we were, as authors often do, um, talking and forgetting who is around us when I asked some questions like, what happens to the blood after he's murdered? Does someone just come clean it up? Does it magically disappear? Who's handling the body? When it occurred to us that the woman at the table beside us looked deeply, deeply <laughs> uncomfortable with the, the content of our conversation, she just, the color just drained from her face. And we all got a really good laugh 
And later on that night, after a few adult beverages, we were still laughing about it when one of us posed the question, wouldn't it have been funny if she assumed you were contract killers? And it was like that lightning moment that so rarely, I find so rarely happens when the premise came first. And all of a sudden, I had this idea for the story of a struggling novelist who was discussing the plot of an overdue no novel with her literary agent over lunch in a crowded restaurant when she is overheard by a woman who offers her a significant sum of money to dispose of her problem husband. And that became the launching point for the story of Finley Donovan. So it was really not even character or plot that came first so much as the pitch, the launching point for this story. From there, later on that night, in pajamas over junk food and lots of adult beverages, we, we hashed out a, a character sketch for who was Finley Donovan, and the rest kind of um, grew from there. <laughs> Can I ask a question? How did you come up with the name? That was um, brainstorming too. We just, you know, we were we were sitting around talking about who who was this main character, and um, I think it was Megan Miranda who suggested Finley, and then we kind of rolled that around until we found a name that we felt like kind of rolled with it, and we know I didn't know at the time that her name would be part of the title, so I had a working title. It was a very very simple working title. It was the hit. Um, which kind of played on the double entendre. Um, and of course, when we sold the book to Minotaur, they said, no, you need a much more interesting title. That's not catchy enough. So we ended up making the, it's sort of, the book is very meta. It's a book happening within a book. So if you're into that sort of thing, it's really fun. But Finley's book, the book she's drafting in book one, is now called The Hit. And so, <laughs> there you go. So if you come up with a good title, you can't, you know, just... Let it go. You have yeah, to you can't let it go. Reuse. Right. <laughs> I love your question about character names because I think it is true. When sometimes it takes a while to find a character name, and then you hit in it, and you're like, oh, and everything kind of makes sense. So, um, I had some specific questions for you all, and you actually answered my first question. So I'll move back to Naomi. Um, what were some of the challenges in setting your mystery during the pandemic? I, I had heard that a lot of editors and agents were saying we're not we're not really ready for this. So I was really curious when I read, I didn't find it um, unpleasant at all to read about it. It was a very different experience than I had during the pandemic. But there were things that were obviously familiar, like the sweatpants and yeah. an extra 10 pounds. Yeah, the 15 and, pounds that's around her middle. No yeah. Taurus. I don't know. Yeah, you know, actually, well, this series is with a smaller uh, publisher. Actually, my that small press was acquired by another press that's located in Nashville. But my, um, for my original editor, she just said, and she loves Hawaii, and she said, Naomi, she was the one who actually encouraged me to set it in the pandemic. I mean, I guess we're, it's a small press, so it's not like we need to sell a lot of books. <laughs> you know, it's more like, let's just, it makes sense. And I had um, a whole wedding, you know, I was going to, do a wedding in Hawaii. That was uh, initially what I was thinking with the second one. Um, but it turned out that it was super helpful. And again, I think it's because of the tropical location. And that's where I wanted to be. And it, it's beautiful. Actually, with the lack of people there, it's even more gorgeous than usual. Um, and in a weird way, um, I was writing about my pen little funny things like you know, the bad haircuts, you know, and <laughs> that you do at home, and yeah, the weight gain, and oh, just cooking, and Leilani's the oldest of the four girls, so she's, and then everybody in the house, and everyone using the internet. Virtual school. You know, yeah. and dealing with young, <laughs> because she has young um, um, sisters, you know, who are still in school, and uh, and just worried about them, and, um, and there's the elder in the house, there's um, a grandmother and just kind of in her whole social network, you know, her ukulele classes are no more and she's like having a real hard time with the isolation. So I could not journal during the pandemic. It was just too, I, and I was thinking, why couldn't I journal? And I think it's because I knew like 
the next week, it would be more of the same. So it'd be kind of depressing to be writing the same thing over and over. But in writing the book, I just, I, I could write about certain milestones that kind of happened during, you know, that period of time. And um, if anything, you know, it'll, it'll be my journal in the book, you know, the li you know how things s are slowly yeah. opening up in Hawaii and all yeah. those things. Great. Um, Catherine, the, the Regency era is really a common setting for many romance novels. Um, you know, and there are some great mystery series also set in there, but it's really much more known, I guess, the Georgette Heyer and that whole thing. So what were some of the challenges you faced and, um, and also what were the rewards of setting a mystery in that era? It's, it's an interesting question because uh, when I started writing it, I mentioned I started with the, the character of, of Lily Adler, who became my, my main sleuth, um, but I actually thought originally that I was writing a romance novel. I thought it was, it was going, so the, the setting in the Regency, um, I thought that was the, the type of book that I was writing. And I very quickly discovered, as soon as I started writing, that that, that didn't fit the character. Um, because I started with such a clear picture of who this, this person was, and you know, who, that she'd been recently widowed, that she was um, trying to, to really rebuild her life. Almost as soon as I started writing, I knew that she was, it was not going to be a romance novel. That was not where she was in life. This character was not going to go off and fall in love. Um, you know, within 300 pages or so. And so I was... So there is hope for her and Jack, you're saying. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not answering that question one way or another. <laughs> um, but because the, the character herself was so influenced by where she was set, um, because for all of us, I think where we are in history really influences our personality and our priorities and how we interact with our world, I couldn't move her out of that setting, even once I knew it wasn't a romance novel. Um, so I, I had this, all these characters that I loved in this setting that I was really interested in who were just completely in search of a plot. And I was just writing sort of in circles, trying to figure out what that plot was. And then a dead body showed up. And I thought, oh, I'm writing a mystery instead. OK. Um, and, and once I found that out, the plot fell into place very quickly. Um, but it's. It was interesting writing a non-romance in the Regency setting because Regency romances, that world is such a particular world. In some ways, it's almost like a, a fantasy world because there are these conventions of what the Regency era was like that romance novelists who write in that era all just accept, and readers accept them, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I, I love reading a good romance novel. Um, but they're not necessarily, this is what that world was like. It's this is what people in this genre have agreed that this world is in this particular genre. So writing a, a mystery there instead of a romance, I didn't, in some ways it was a little bit of a challenge because I knew that anyone who was used to reading a romance in that, in that era might pick up a book that I'd written and expect a lot of those same conventions or um, those same sort of historical assumptions. Um, but I didn't necessarily want to have all those in there. So in some ways, it was a little bit of a challenge because I knew I'd be working against some reader expectations. But in other ways, it was very freeing because I could say, I'm not writing a romance anymore. So I don't have to necessarily stick with what readers are expecting in terms of how these people would behave or who is going to be there or how many dukes there are in any given room. Um, because in romances, there tend to be a lot of a lot yes. of unattached, very <laughs> handsome dukes. Um, so I, it gave me a chance to really dive into the actual history of the Regency outside of what I thought I knew about it. Um, and I discovered that what I thought I knew about it really just skimmed the surface. It was an era that had a very, this very beautiful, elegant veneer, like you, you picture a, a Jane Austen novel and you know, all these people at parties and you know, talking very beautifully around very difficult topics. But it had a lot going on underneath the surface in terms of um, social unrest and role, changing roles between um, one war ending and of soldiers coming home and changes in family dynamics as a result of that war and social dynamics in terms of people moving to cities and leaving the country. And so there was just there was a lot going on um, that I really got to, to dive into and explore and then explore through my characters. And that was, that was a lot of fun. Um, but it also ended up meaning I had to do a lot more research than I expected that I would have to do. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, Elle, your character 
is really more of an accidental um, hit woman than an <laughs> accidental detective. Um, how did you walk the line of having her likable but um, still making the stakes high in your story? Yeah, there's, um, there's quite a bit of sleuthing that goes on because it's still a murder mystery, but um, without giving too much away, um, she does start the story as an accidental hit woman. And um, it kind of posed an interesting challenge creatively because obviously I wanted her to be relatable and likable enough that characters would cheer for her, but this is not an occupation that one normally associates with the mother of two small children <laughs> who's trying to make ends meet in suburban Northern Virginia. So um, it was a fine line at times to walk. And the story is also very madcap. It's very Lucy and Ethel in its um, kind of rompiness, if you will. There's um, a lot of outlandish things that happen along the way in the plot. And what I found to be kind of critical in all of this is anchoring my reader in a very relatable, real character. So Finley's voice um, as a mother, um, as a newly single um, mother of two small children, as a struggling author, um, you know, is, is very authentic. I think it reads very authentic on the page. I try to um, explore her character very, very deeply in very real ways and poignant ways throughout the story as almost a touchstone, um, not just to keep the reader grounded, but also because it's important for me that you cheer for her. Um, and so, you know, I'm asking you to open a book and, and cheer for someone who is potentially about to do some pretty heinous things. Um, and so it was important to me kind of getting out of the gate that Finley be relatable, um, someone that, you know, that we can all see a little glimmer of ourselves in, um, in order to continue cheering for her so that when she does potentially do something quite criminal, we're all on board, let's go. <laughs> um, and so I hope that it's really the voice of the story that accomplishes that. Great. Naomi, your, um, your detective seems to be related to everyone in Hawaii, um, <laughs> or has known them in some capacity for years, which I felt incredibly authentic. I had a friend who was Hawaiian in, in Brooklyn, and her husband said, as soon as we get on the plane, she starts finding cousins when they were <laughs> flying back home. So I don't know, that felt incredibly realistic. Um, but she's also seen as really more of a danger than a help by most of the characters. She's in her 20s, right? And um, so what were the advantages of having her as your detective? Well, one thing with Leilani, um, she, so she's from this Kauai. She's from Waimea near Waimea Canyon. But she goes off to college. You know, she goes to the mainland. She goes to the University of Washington. But she has to drop out. She can't, I mean, and then she gets a, a job at a tech company in Seattle. But eventually she uh, returns home, her mother, um, has MS, and she's worried about her mother, her grandmother, her, her sisters. And um, she had kind of a bad reputation in high school, like the local um, police chief, um, you know, who is actually related to her, <laughs> <laughs> um, ha has put her in the black and white for assorted, you know, misdemeanor type activity. So it's like, just any of us, like when you go home and you didn't, you know, you don't have the best reputation, like what are you gonna do? So a lot of it is, it's also the, the series is about Leilani just dealing with her personal uh, reputation, her demons, like um, she feels an obligation to her family. Um, and, and it's also her finding herself in the place that she grew up with. And um, you know, for, for all of us, we need a lot of obstacles. So that's Leilani's obstacle. Great. Catherine, um, you have a Bow Street detective, Simon Page, as your second point of view character. Um, and it's for obvious reasons. He can go where your detective can go. What were some of the advantages of having an upper class woman, Lily? Um, as an amateur sleuth in your mystery? Uh, I think for 
like you said, um, Simon, as a detective, can go places that Lily can't go, but because she is upper class, she can also go places that he can't go. Um, one of the things that I discovered in the course of my research was that uh, the Bow Street Force, while very well known um, historically for people who know about historical detective forces, which is maybe not like common knowledge in that in the world, um, but for people who read books set in the Regency, um, it's, it's a very well known police force, but it was actually not very well received at the time by the upper classes when it was um, in operation because they were so used to handling things on their own. Um, there was a very stratified justice system at the time. Um, and for example, if you were um, a, a peer in England, you could not be tried in a regular court. You had to be tried by the House of Lords. Um, so you, that was basically all your buddies <laughs> trying you for whatever crime you had done. So there was a lot of resistance in the upper classes to having any kind of police presence in their lives. Um, there was a lot of a lot of people bribing officers to leave their families alone or to kind of push things under the rug, or they could simply just refuse to answer questions or to have the police officer um, or detective in their in their space on their property. Like there was a lot and. They didn't have the same um, legal uh, legal venues or legal remedies as detectives to say, oh, no, you have to let me in the way people can do, like with a warrant today, for example. Um, so it would have been much harder for Simon, the detective, as a member of the lower classes and a member of the police force to get access to the places he needed to um, to investigate the murder that, that happens in the book. Um, which is why he ends up asking Lily for help because they've crossed paths before and he knows that she, as a friend of this, this family um, where the, the patriarch has, has been found murdered, she can get access to them that he cannot. She can you know, call on them socially. She can talk to them without putting their backs up the same way that he can. So in a lot of ways, they, you know, in the detective and the amateur sleuth in this really balance each other out because they have two different points of access um, to the people that... that need investigating and Simon comes at it with a very goal-oriented practical like this is my job and I'm going to find out what's going on um, way of looking at things where Lily comes at it from much more of a roundabout like I know this world I know these people I understand how to approach them in a way that'll help us find the information we need um, without them necessarily realizing that that's what I'm doing here. Well I think you really laid out sort of the um sort of what are the challenges and the payoffs of having an amateur sleuth, because really, I was, I mean, I'm a little slow lately, but I was like, oh, accidental detective, that's really just another name for amateur sleuth. Um, what do you see, uh, Naomi, some of the, the challenges and the payoffs of having an amateur sleuth uh, for your story? I love amateur sleuths. Um, I, you know, I, actually, I, I wrote an essay about this, how to write an amateur sleuth for the Mystery Writers of America, they have a handbook. Lee Child edited it. I think it's like How to Write a Mystery. And um, I think sometimes hard-boiled writers, they kind of, you know, put their, no oh, amateur sleuth. Oh, <laughs> that's just like cat stories. You know, but um, I think that um, amateur sleuth, it, it, I maintain that it, it, it really reveals a lot about the writer. Um, because, you know, how many, you know, every, every mystery is a fantasy, right? If you listen to, if you talk to a police, a policeman, how many times have they discharged their weapon? You know, some people, none, you know? How many PIs are actually, you know, they're just sitting in the car, like, watching, you know, taking their iPhone or their camera. It's not very exciting. Um, so... I think we have the challenge of creating a world that makes sense, you know, to you all. Um, there's no, and then each amateur sleuth is unique, like each person on this panel. So we have to create this wor new world for you to understand what um, uh, are are the rules in this world, the realities in this world, and um, make make you, you know, follow, you know, Jessica Fletcher, you know, make you not, you know, so what if all these people are dying in Cabot Cove, you know, you're, you're with her, you get it, you know, and, um, and another thing um, I maintain, like I'm from Los Angeles, you know, so the, 
um, Mexican culture is very big over there, and there's Dia de los Muertos there, and they're like these skeleton, and then there's these little skeletons, and they're always they're doing every every little little everyday activities like they're making breakfast you know and you have these little sculptures there and in a way it's their way of laughing at death because we're all and I I'm going to tell you a secret we're all going to die <laughs> you know but um but I think that's what we do in these amateur sleuth um you know we bring joy you know because yeah the world is kind of bleak so but we we're going to laugh every single minute you know that we can so I think that's really the magic of, of our subgenre. Elle, I'm sorry to make you go after an expert. <laughs> that was amazing. I loved, I loved but you can every... talk about your personal book. And I, your answer, I, I loved everything about that answer and the whole idea of you know, fantasy and, and the significance of the amateur sleuth. I love that. Um, and that's a hard answer to follow, too, because it, it's perfect. Um, no, really. Um, but what I will say is that I think one of the um, trickiest, the trickiest challenges for me in writing Amateur Sleuth is the subject of agency. Um, and so when you have a police officer, or you have a, a private detective, or you have um, someone who, you know, a medical examiner, someone who can get behind the scenes, and they are credentialed to do to run tests, to ask questions, to interview witnesses, um, that they have the agency already. When you have an amateur sleuth, we have to find ways to give them agency, to give them control of their own plot and their own involvement in their own story. And that's a challenge um, for, I, I think, for all of us. Um, and always in my first draft, that's always the, the critique and the criticism that I get after first draft is give her more agency. It, it's hard to take a situation where the only thing you might be qualified to do is eavesdrop on conversations and find ways to put your amateur sleuth in situations where they can actively investigate a crime and become part of the plot of their own story. But I think the challenge is also the fun part for me um, is it forces us to, like a fantasy author forces us to create a world and create those situations that Naomi was talking about. If I could jump in real fast, oh, I yeah. think those answers combined are really, really excellent because it encapsulates a lot about I think why mystery as a genre is so popular, and especially right now in the last two years. I mean, at least my publisher has told me like mystery sales are through the roof, and I think that sense of agency mm -hmm. and that sense of like there's rules and there's orderliness, and mm -hmm. and you you have this expectation that like this person might not know what they're doing at the beginning, but by the end they're going to figure it out, and the bad guy's going to get caught, and it's all going to come together in this way that feels really satisfying and tidy, like. We all want that. We want that fantasy. We want that sense of agency and control. And I think, especially in the last two years, people have wanted that more than ever. And I, for me, at least, that's why I love reading mysteries. Because even if there's, you know, even if you know, even if there's things in the course of it that surprise you and you hope that there will be, um, you, you feel confident that those things will be there, that there will be this sense of order to the ending, that things will come together in a really satisfying way. That we'll have answers. Yes. Yeah. And that's not something and you necessarily... Justice. And, and justice. And that's not don't necessarily happen in real life. Um, mm -hmm. But it's really very satisfying when you get them on the page. I mean, it's always a really interesting uh, to, to try writing Amateur Sleuth because you realize if you were to ever find a dead body, the first thing you would do is call 911, and you would not... <laughs> involve yourself at all so it does take this giant leap of faith and that's but I think that makes the characters really compelling mm -hmm. who is this person that would say oh no wait I'm gonna figure this out myself so um I wanted to ask about research and I know some of you have answered this a little bit did you have did you do a lot of hitman research for this? <laughs> I mean none that I can divulge <laughs> while live streaming. Um, I mean, and also, you know, do you do it before you start writing, while you're writing, or do you try to fix things later? <laughs> Research for me is an ongoing process. And, um, and so I find that um, I'm most creative when I'm not behind a computer screen. And so research for me 
becomes the most fun part of what I do. Um, and I try to make it very active. Um, I, one of my very, very favorite research opportunities is something called the Writers Police Academy, which is offered annually. Um, it is a, like a conference, a convention, a collection of workshops offered by law enforcement and first responders and um, uh, forensic scientists and attorneys and, um, and judges and uh, people who really have the knowledge that we need, the people that we would like to ask really embarrassing questions of. You know, questions about the ways to, many ways to get away with murder that we would never be able to ask anywhere else without being misunderstood. These are questions that we can go to police academy and, and investigate. And as part of that, we've done lots of hands-on workshops. I've done ride-alongs with deputy sheriffs. I've searched jail cells for contraband. I've um, participated in mock murder trials. Um, I have done fingerprint analysis and presumptive blood blood testing. Um, so there's lots of cool hands-on things, hostage negotiations, all kinds of fun things that we do there. But the program also, as a new writer, gave me the courage to find opportunities to go out and do that kind of research on my own, to make the phone calls and say, I am a new author. Um, no, you have not read my books. No, you probably never heard of me. But would it be OK if I come and observe and ask a bunch of really weird questions? Um, and so I have toured, I've spent a day touring the Northern Virginia Regional Forensics Laboratory in Manassas, Virginia, um, which I highly recommend when COVID is behind us and they reopen for tours. That's something all of you can do, and it's a, a fantastic opportunity. So lots of hands-on. Um, next week, I'm taking my very first handgun class, which is going to be critical for um, a particular book that I'm working on right now. And I had a lot of questions, and I called and said, could I interview a handgun specialist? And they said, why don't you just come take a class? Great. Sign me up. So um, research for me is kind of ongoing, and I sort of bank it all away, and I use it not only as creative fodder, but also to try to make the bits of my story more authentic that might otherwise be, you know, to kind of balance out the outlandish. Um, and then, of course, there's always the occasional Google search, which was became the mainstay during COVID when we couldn't get out quite as much. Um, and you know, telephone interviews. And this week, I'll be interviewing by phone a um, police psychologist. Um, so those kinds of things are sort of ongoing in my work. I think we all live in fear that someone's going to look at our Google search. Because you know? <laughs> I'm sure you put in like, "Where's the best place to dump a body?" So and... my husband is a <laughs> net, my husband is a network security specialist. <laughs> And he's constantly terrified. <laughs> Do you really, really have to phrase the question that way? Did you really have to put it in a search engine? So yeah, we have that conversation on the regular. <laughs> he's expecting a knock. Right? How about you? You mentioned the mayor's TikTok videos yes. and that you were sort of stuck at home and not able to go. But. Well, that's wonderful that you're be you'll be able to do some hands-on research with the gun. Yeah, but before the pandemic, I did take um, ATF class. And it was like the same thing. Um, we went to the local Target, and we were supposed to be doing surveillance. There was supposed to be a drug deal. And then I saw people in my class, like there were like these belts that were hanging, and they were like looking through the belts, <laughs> doing all this stuff. And then um, uh, we were also doing a drug bust, and we were wearing the bulletproof vests. And there were we had these guns with rubber bullets, and um, the next day, my whole body ached yeah. because it was so heavy, and I didn't realize. But um, we also um, you know, shot different kinds of weapons, which was really helpful. But um, oh, and then the, there was also this exercise where you see this video, and it's at some scenario, and you have like this gun, and you're supposed to you know, protect your partner. And I kept hitting my partners, like knees. It would go, ow, ow. I was going, I'm sorry. But it was interesting because some people who would come, like they would come in this camouflage, like they're a macho, you know. And um, the instructor told me later, he goes, those people, they do, they're awful because they're so emotional. You know, like, and the guy who did the best was a person who had studied martial arts. So that, I thought that was really interesting. But regarding the Hawaii research, just the only thing that was 
um, visceral that I could do was I ordered poi and taro or hollow products from Kauai and had them delivered to Pasadena, California, and that was my one sensory kind of it was experience. It a hard job. Yeah. Somebody had to do it. <laughs> Catherine, it sounds like you did a lot of research. Did you did you do it at the beginning, in the middle, afterward? Did you have to? I would say for hist a historical setting, um, the bulk of the research happens up front because in order to figure out what the characters can and can't do and what would be happening in the bigger world at the time and sort of the social conventions and all of that, I, I needed to know that before I started plotting. Otherwise, I'd have to redo a lot of the plot. Um, but it's also the sort of thing for me that as I'm writing, like it is, it is very much ongoing up until I'm sending the final, final edits um, to my publisher, because I'll get to, you know, this one line, and I'll think like, oh, I said it took them 20 minutes to walk from here to here, but I don't live in London. Like, does it actually take 20 minutes to walk from there to there? Yeah, I'm going to go to Google and I'm going to plug in there and see how long it it would actually take the characters to get there, because maybe how much time it takes them to get there affects who is still there or who is left by the time they they arrive, and how much time would it be in a carriage to get from this city to this city? Or Google doesn't that, have a carriage option. So a lot of <laughs> you should make Sadly. a suggestion. But there's there are specific facts on how long in the Regency it would take someone by carriage or by horse to go a certain number of miles. So you can check the miles on Google oh. and then divide. Oh. Um, you have to use math. Though. Yes, there's there's a little bit of math involved. <laughs> <laughs> that liberal arts degree is coming in handy. Um, <laughs> But so there's a, there's a lot of little fact checking up until the end, just to make sure things are you know vibing with the world as much as possible. Um, but then there's always that point, especially I, I'm sure you all have this too. But I find it particularly in historical where you look at okay, this is what the fact is, and this is what I need the story to be, and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go with the story because that works better in a book because it is for me historical fiction, and I would rather tell a good story than get every single detail. Absolutely right. Plus, if you get the big world details right, people don't notice when you get the little ones wrong. So, so has anybody written to you to, has anyone noticed anything? Actually, people tend to write about the things that are not wrong, where they'll say, like, that's too modern. People didn't say that then. People didn't do that then. And you're like, you're wrong, actually. I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's I, like, say, yeah. I don't usually say that to them. I'm just, oh, that's very interesting. But um, I, I hear that the most people get a lot of um, letters about guns. If yes. somebody uses a gun, they say, oh, that gun doesn't do this or that or whatever. And I sort of got around that by just saying, it's a gun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And having that's a character a that doesn't actually know what kind of gun it is yeah. so that they can't tell you. That's actually one of the reasons I end up writing historical things is because I don't have to know as much about like modern forensics and <laughs> stuff like that. Maybe you should go to the Writers Police Academy. I kind of want to yeah. now. <laughs> just, yeah, just for an experience, right? <laughs> well, um, I wanted to make sure we had time for questions. I have more questions and we can talk for hours more, even though I think a giant gorilla hand will take us off the stage at a certain point. But do people have any questions so far? Yes. I don't know if this is a silly question, but what are some of your like inspirations or, I know this, who do you read things a little much, but like who, who do you look to or is there somebody that you've read that you that you're, not that you would emulate, but that inspired you in any way? Okay, I'm gonna repeat the question. So the question is, um, what inspires you? Is there anyone you read particularly mm -hmm. that inspires you? If anyone wants to answer. When we were first um, pitching the stories of Finley Donovan to publishers, one of the biggest pieces of feedback that we would get is, we're not real sure what this story is. I mean, it's a mystery, but it's so many other things. It's a real genre bender. And it didn't occur to me until that moment that because I'd come from writing YA for 10 years, genre bending came very natural for me because in young adult fiction, we don't tend to categorize or shelve strictly by genre, it's, it's mostly by age group. So we have YA and within YA, there's all kinds of different books and those books tend to cross pollinate each other and you see genre mashed up all the time. So when I made the jump into the world of adult fiction, that was not always the case. And I took great inspiration from other authors who had done this very successfully. So I looked to authors like Janet Ivanovich, um, who combines humor and madcap and, um, and stories of sisterhood and 
uh, mystery and thrillers with a little bit of romance and pulled it all together and kind of created her own awesome genre. Um, Charlene Harris is another who incorporates paranormal into all of that soup of awesome to create something very, very uniquely hers. Um, Dorinda Jones is another great example of um, an author who's pulled this off very successfully with fantastic mysteries that are also so many other things. And I drew a lot of hope from that and inspiration from that in a time when I was seeing a lot of rejections for these books because publishers really didn't know how to categorize them or how to how to pitch them. And so that's really, those are some of the greats that I took my inspiration from. Um, for me, with my first series, it's a Masa Rai series, it's a um, aging gardener and um, atomic bomb survivor who solves crimes and he's an older man he starts off 69 there's seven books and he it ends with him being 86 so I've never been one to follow the conventions but people that have inspired me one I can mention uh, there's been actually a lot of African American um, detective writers one being um, Barbara Neely, the late Barbara Neely, she wrote Blanche on the Lamb. It's about this cranky, you know, black maid in the South who um, solves crimes. And actually, that's how I found my agent, because I was looking at the acknowledgments. And usually, if they have a good experience, writers will acknowledge their agent. And then I wrote to the agency, and then someone who worked there asked for the manuscript. They took three months before they got back to me, but and they asked for a rewrite. I rewrote it, and um, they she eventually uh, represented me. So that so I have Barbara Neely to thank for that. Oh wow, great story. Um, so I would say, really, I just I love what so many mystery authors are doing right now. There's a lot of great historical mystery authors out there right now. I think it's a a, a subsection of a subgenre that you're seeing a lot. So um, Deanna Rayborn, uh, Sherry Thomas, Greer McAllister, I think are all fantastic writers. Um, uh, Sujata Masi, fan absolutely wonderful. Um, when I'm looking for, when I want a little inspiration in terms of finding those like uh, very traditional elements of like mystery pacing and reveals and just how to get sort of that fair play feel there. Um, a lot of times I'll go back to golden age mystery writers like Agatha Christie or Dorothy L. Sayers, um, Nio Marsh, who just really defined the genre and it helps you not necessarily see what to do, but see seeing what other people do have done at and especially the people who originated the genre can really help you figure out whether you want to do those same things or whether you want to shake it up a little bit. And if you're going to, where can you do it in places that will still um, make for a satisfying ending? Because it is a genre that has a few rules and expectations about how it's going to come together. And you want to not, you don't want to leave your readers unsatisfied at the end of it. Um, so balancing that out. Uh, if I need inspiration about world building, a lot of times I'll actually pick up fantasy authors um, because in a lot of ways, writing historical, you have to do a lot of world building. You have to give people that sense of world and that sense of place that is somewhere that is completely foreign to them, but you don't want to burden them with it. You don't want to spend all your time telling them this is what the world is like and then like here's a little bit of mystery to go along with it. Um, so if I need to just see how someone doles out that kind of information in a very elegant and very well-paced way, I'll pick up someone like N.K. Jemison, who I think is, um, she is a fantasy writer, and I think she might be the best world-building writer out there right now. And just in terms of what information she reveals explicitly and what she sort of lets her characters talk about without necessarily defining for the reader, she has an amazing balance in her work. And so that's something that I... It's sort of a cross-genre um, way that I like to, to learn and see what other people are doing. So. What is her name again? N.K. Jemison. Um, I haven't read her. Yeah. Absolutely recommend her. She's okay. fantastic. Okay. Um, <laughs> Great. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. When you, um, when you begin the, the story, do you already know um, how um, you're going to solve the mystery, how you're going to solve the crime? and who the perpetrator is, or, or does, the, uh, does the story sort of unfold and the characters sort of play themselves into something? Great question. So the question is, 
When you start off, do you already know who is going to die, who did it, or, and, and we always have that sort of like what, plotter and pantser, you know, some people have to lay it all out and some people find out as, they, as it goes along. Usually, no. <laughs> At what point do you figure that out? Like, uh, you know, usually it depends on the book. Um, sometimes one third, mm -hmm. sometimes even two. I mean, I could narrow it down. It's got to be this one or this one. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> and then they come up, you know, they it rise gives you lots to the of equation. good red herrings, especially if you think it's somebody else, and then they're like, I'm innocent. And then you're like, oh, no, <laughs> who did it? <laughs> I'm always fascinated by people's process because no two authors I ever talk to entirely create the same way. And I just mm -hmm. think that's fantastic. Um, I usually kind of go in with a rough idea of where I'm going. I kind of start with the end in mind, but I try not to hold myself too tightly to that because I like exploring as I go. And I normally find that I, um, about 75% of the way into the story is where I really discover the heart, thematically the heart of my story, and that's usually where I start again. And I try to give myself room to, to play along the way. Um, but I, uh, as far as the mystery element goes, the who done it, um, I usually have a pretty solid idea where I'm going with that. I would say I'm I'm pretty similar. Um, the first book that I, first mystery I wrote, um, the body in the garden, I did not know exactly how it was going to wrap up at the end, and I basically wrote two books worth of story and then had to scrap half of the book and rewrite a lot of things because the ending was different than I expected it to be. Um, and just to make sure that the whole mystery came together well, I had to go back and do a lot of rewriting. So I tend to outline more now. Um, I treat outlining a lot like writing a f my first draft in a lot of ways. I will spend several days on it. Um, I will sit there and basically do a paragraph for each scene that I expect to happen so that I can go through and figure out this is what they need to discover here. This is what where there's a misdirect, this is where there's a red herring, this is where they find this clue, this is how it all comes together. And over the course of putting that plot together, I tend to discover what's going on with the characters and what their arcs are. Um, and then I also find that as I'm writing those things, I think similar to what you were saying, what's going on with the characters, how they're growing, what those tend to surprise me more as I'm writing. Um, but, and I'll have scenes that I didn't expect to happen pop up also. But in terms of the actual mystery, I tend to figure that out in the outlining stage so that I know that I get all the clues and pieces um, in place where they need to. That said, I'm also, I went through that process for the book that I'm, I'm currently working on right now, and I got half of it done. I got the outline done, then got half the book done, and then had to throw it all away and start over again. So it's not a foolproof process. <laughs> There's... There's times when it doesn't work anyway. Um, Writing is rewriting. Yes. <laughs> so with, many times. With my contemporary mysteries, it's I know my second one, um, a reviewer, what was her name? Mayhem in the Midlands. Do you remember that conference in Nebraska? There was this woman named Sally. She passed away, but she would, um, she would do a lot of reviews, and she kind of insinuated and it, it, that... I had to, it was too much like a, a ball of yarn that, too, you know, there was too many threads coming out. And I took that to heart and I was going, I need to lessen, you know, the number of suspects, you know, to make this a more enjoyable experience for my readers. So, um, but, um, and, and most of them, I mean, I, I have to admit on some of them, I, you know, I, I haven't been as fair as others, but I know for me when I watch BBC Mystery sometimes, it's some minor side character who did it, and it makes me so mad, you know, right? <laughs> it's some really, you know, I mean, and I think I might have done that with some of my books, but I, I'm trying to, you know, strengthen fair. that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I know we just have about a minute left, but if everyone could quickly say what's next after this sure. coming down the pipe. Um, here today we have Finley Donovan is Killing It, which is book one, it's pink. Finley Donovan Knocks Him Dead, which is book two, it's blue. And our third Finley Donovan book is now um, in revisions and will be releasing January 31st. The title is yet to be revealed. Finley Donovan <laughs> is... Finley Donovan gets up to something. We'll figure and it's it out. purple. I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I don't yet know the color. Oh, okay. Stay tuned. <laughs> I'm working on the follow-up to my historic novel, um, Clark and Division. It's called Evergreen. It will be set in 
Los Angeles in 1946, and I'm currently still writing it at the Omni Hotel. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I have two books coming out this summer. Uh, The first one in June is a different series that's launching. It's uh, called Last Last Call at the Nightingale. It is set in um, 1920s New York. It is a lot less cozy than the Lily Adler series. It's a little little grittier, a little rougher. Um, it really plays with the, the prohibition vibe. So it's kind of sexy and glamorous. The heroine is a working class uh, girl this time who's uh, very poor and finds herself way in over her head when she also stumbles on a dead body. And then um, later in the summer, I will have the third Lily Adler book coming out also, and that is called Death at the Manor, and that one has a little, still has that cozy historical feel, but has a little bit of a gothic vibe in there also. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you all of you for being here.